Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the seventh annual Norman E. Borlaug Lecture. I'm Don Bites, and I'm a professor in the Department of Animal Science and the Biochemistry Department. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to uh, this uh, lecture tonight. The uh, lecture is sponsored by the Nutritional Science Council on this campus, and uh, the council uh, is, has been in existence at Iowa State since 1954. So if you do your math, that's, uh, I hope, 54 years of age. Uh, the council was established to coordinate nutrition course offerings between the Department of Animal Science and the department then called Food and Nutrition. And the, uh, the uh, council sponsored at that time and still does today a seminar program that uh, is called Modern Views in Nutrition. Earlier it was, it was held on 8.30 on Saturday mornings. Well, with modern times, we moved from uh, Saturday uh, to Wednesday. Today we have an interdepartmental major in nutritional science that re resulted from a discussion about the education program of our graduate students. We have a summer lectureship that's uh, gone on for uh, quite a number of years. Uh, a current issues in nutrition seminar program also sponsored by the council. A David R. Griffith Research Excellence Award to recognize excellence of our graduate students. And we have a small grants program that, was, uh, that is supported by an endowment from a benefactor to uh, this uh, council. And uh, we have been sponsoring, of course, as I mentioned, for the seventh time now, the Norman E. Borlaug Lecture. The uh, lecture is uh, conducted in association with World Food Prize Week. And we're honored tonight to have with us Ambassador Kenneth Quinn, who is the president of the World Food Prize. And I'd like to introduce Ken to all of you, and uh, let's do so with an applause first. And Ken, would you come forth and tell us a little bit about the uh, World Food Prize Week, please, and make any introdu introductions that you wish. Thank you, Professor Bites. Hi, great to be on campus with all of you. World Food Prize Week. Uh, Everybody at Iowa State, I know, knows that October 16th, Thursday, is World Food Day. And I believe, and I feel fairly certain, that our celebration of the World Food Prize all week is the single greatest observance of World Food Day anywhere around the globe. And it's always such a great pleasure, and thanks to President Joffrey and uh, the Nutrition Council, that we can start it here at Iowa State. Tomorrow... Come to Des Moines. We have the Hunger Summit all day. It's free. We've got a presidential candidates forum in the afternoon where they're going to tell you about things that Senator Obama and Senator McCain agree on about fighting hunger. Uh, on Wednesday night at the State Historical Building, Senator Dole and Senator McGovern, our laureates, are going to have a free forum. Thursday night, if you don't have a ticket to come to the Capitol to see the ceremony, Iowa Public Television will broadcast it in high definition. It'll be a wonderful ceremony. It's a great week because Norman Borlaug is coming to town. He's been sick, in and out of the hospital, near death, but he has got his strength together, and he lands tomorrow, and he is going to be back in the state of his birth, imbuing us with his presence and the inspiration of his life and his achievements. And if you have a, a chance to see him in any way, he's only be able to do a a few things, but uh, he had uh, a couple of dreams, and we have two people here tonight who are part of our symposium. We've got 48 of the leading experts in the world who are going to be at our symposium, uh, and we have a special rate for students to come down, $99, two lunches, breakfast, and all of the knowledge that you can digest. Uh, Dr. Borlaug, his dream is to bring the green revolution to Africa, and here tonight is Dr. Nmanga Ngongi who is the head of the African Green Revolution Association that with the Gates Foundation, if anybody's going to bring it to Africa, it's him and that group. Please stand up and everyone welcome you. And with him is Dr. Ravi Singh, who for the last 25 years has been at CIMIT in Mexico, working with Dr. Borlaug. And that's, so... 
it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a terrific uh, week. And the only thing that to cap off World Food Prize Week, what would be the single best finish? It would be I State over Nebraska. Thank you, Ambassador Quinn. Wonderful to have this great celebration in the state of Iowa about food, isn't it? And the World Food Prize. I uh, need to mention that Helen Jensen needs to be recognized for her part in organizing tonight's program. And after the lecture tonight, we will have an announcement of the winners of the poster contest, and that contest was organized by Pat Murphy. So please uh, stay around for uh, the recognition of our students. Then to uh, move on into the lecture, uh, President Joffrey will introduce our speaker, and we all know uh, and love President Joffrey. Came from uh, University of Maryland, where he was uh, vice president for academic affairs and provost. And uh, before that, he was a Penn Stater, moved through the ranks, and became a dean at Penn, at Penn State University. Uh, president Joffrey is loved by faculty, loved by students. Uh, his enthusiasm, his positiveness is very contagious. And he is going to introduce our speaker for tonight. So please welcome President Joffrey. Thanks very much, Don. And uh, I want to welcome all of you tonight uh, to this lecture. We are very pleased to every year host the Norman Borlaug Lecture. Uh, and I really want to thank the many organizers and sponsors who uh, help us do that. Uh, all of us here at Iowa State University greatly appreciate the efforts and leadership of the World Food Prize Foundation in raising the visibility of the problems of world hunger and in recognizing the many people uh, around the world who have devoted their lives and careers to alleviating world hunger and poverty. We're certainly very grateful, deeply appreciative of the vision and inspiration of Dr. Norman Borlaug, and the tremendous efforts of Executive Director uh, Ken Quinn and all the members of the uh, foundation, of the World Food Prize Foundation. Uh, I'd like to point out that we have another activity here at Iowa State University tomorrow that's also important to our efforts to alleviate world hunger. Uh, tomorrow morning, we will dedicate uh, the addition to the university's Seed Science Center. Uh, it's a key research and development center at Iowa State that's devoted to improving crop seeds. And of course, that's so very important to feeding the world's growing population. Tonight, we are very honored to have Sir Gordon Conway as the 2008 Norman Borlaug Lecturer. Sir Gordon has provided key scientific, educational, and humanitarian leadership to our world in the fight against hunger and poverty. He is a pioneer in sustainable agriculture, beginning with his work in Sabah, North Borneo, more than 50 years ago. And today, many scientists and institutions around the world, including Iowa State University, are following the path that he blazed in developing sustainable agriculture and sustainable rural livelihoods. From 1970 to 1986, Sir Gordon was professor of environmental technology at Imperial College in London. And during that time, he lived and worked in many countries in Asia and the Middle East. He directed the Sustainable Agriculture Program of the International Institute for Environment and Development based in London before becoming representative of the Ford Foundation in New Delhi, India from 1988 to 1992. Sir Gordon served as Vice Chancellor of the University of Sussex. Uh, which in England is equivalent to president of a university here in the United States, and chair of the Institute for Development Studies from 1992 to 1998, and then president of the Rockefeller Foundation from 1998 to 2004. He was appointed to his current position as chief scientific advisor to the Department for International Development in 2005, and he also holds the title of professor of international development at Imperial College. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, a Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, and is president of the Royal Geographical Society and Chair of Visiting Arts. 
He's the author of several books, including Unwelcome Harvest, Agriculture and Pollution, The Doubly Green Revolution, Food for All in the 21st Century, and Islamophobia, a Challenge for Us All. Sir Gordon was educated at the University of Wales, Cambridge, Trinidad, and the University of California at Davis. We are very pleased to welcome Sir Gordon Conway as the 2008 Norman Borlaug Lecture at Iowa State University. Thank you, President Joffrey. Let's, I'm really delighted to be here. I have to say it's my first visit to Iowa State. It's wonderful to be here, but in particular, I feel very honored to be giving a lecture in honor of Norman Borlaug. I got to know Norman over the years. I think I, I and my wife particularly treasure one evening sitting under a tree in Uganda when he sat and for about an hour told us the story of how he got the seeds from Mexico, the wheat seeds from Mexico to India and Pakistan. One of those wonderful stories that he can tell. It's a great privilege to have known him in that way. Um, we're living in a time of crisis. In fact, not just in a time of one crisis, but a time of at least seven crises. Financial, food, climate change, terrorism. And the problem we face is that these crises sit over very complex systems which we don't understand. We don't understand them, moreover, we don't know how to manage them as we've seen these last few weeks. What I think is particularly scary is that these crises are now beginning to link up with each other. What it means is we're going to need tremendous analysis in the next few years and great leadership. And a lot of solving these crises, I'm afraid, is going to fall on your shoulders. It's a weighty burden in a way, but it's also in some ways going to be exciting. We've seen a spike in food prices. We know pretty well why that happened. Spikes occur because something gets short, prices go up, people produce more, the prices go down. What happened was our stocks of grain came much lower. And there was more consumption than production. There was probably enough food in the world, but people began, when I say people, people who speculate on these things, began to realize that there might be a crunch coming. That's what triggered a lot of the crisis. Part of the reason why we didn't have high stocks was that there were failures of harvest in places like the Ukraine and in Australia. The Murray River has been, the basin has been running dry for several years. Crops are very much less than they normally were. There may have been a climate change effect. Nobody's quite sure, but Australian scientists say the evapotranspiration that occurred during the drought was greater than it would otherwise be because of higher surface temperature. Well, that may be the first occasion in which climate change is having some effect on a major crisis. We also know that biofuel demand has been rocketing in recent years. And of course, oil prices went up. And actually, the oil prices went up before the food prices. In some respects, the increase in oil price was the driver for the food price. One argument is that the oil prices went up because of the decline in the dollar. These are very complex situations, and there will be economists in the audience who will say, no, it wasn't quite this, it was something else. That's the problem. They are very complicated. But one consequence of the increase in oil prices is the increase in fertilizer prices. 
Just look at that green line, which is the line for diammonium phosphate. It's gone up six times in the last year. I couldn't work out why it had gone up so high until last week at the World Bank, somebody took me on one side and said, don't you realize what's happening? And it's this. Take phosphate, which is in relatively short supply and so is expensive. You've got to mix it with ammonia, and the ammonia takes energy. But you also need sulfur. And the sulfur is in short supply, in part because it's used in the industrial processes that are developing in India and China. So these things begin to come together. So there was a spike. Many economists would say, well, that's the kind of thing you get. You know, sometimes prices go up, sometimes they come down. It's gone down to about what it was, the food price index has gone down to what it was at the beginning of this year. But that's still 50% above what it was at the beginning of 2007. More importantly, the spike sits on top of a big churning system. A whole range of drivers there that are changing the world of food and hunger. Populations, per capita incomes, demand for livestock, demand for biofuel, demand for land, slowing of productivity. Some countries have still got a lot of land where they can grow crops. Angola, the Sudan, Mozambique, Brazil. But many countries, India, for example, have run out of arable land. The question is, is there enough so that we can feed poor people? There's also a huge demand for livestock products. Look at the two upper bars there the white and the light gray, that's the consumption of pork. And no, CN stands for China. Half of the pork in the world is eaten in China. That's the scale of the increase that we've seen. I know that many people think we should all become vegetarians. That might be a good idea, but I don't think it's going to happen. Then there is the question of biofuels. One of the problems with biofuels is distinguishing why are we growing them. Are we growing them to reduce carbon emissions? Are we growing them so we can increase incomes of small and large farmers? Are we growing them for energy security so we can be independent, say, of Middle Eastern oil? Those are different objectives. And you often come up with different answers as to whether or not you should grow a biofuel on a particular place. If you grow the biofuel to reduce carbon and to benefit small farmers, you have to answer those questions. Is it profitable? Is it cheap? Is it environmentally friendly? Is it socially acceptable? Will it benefit the poor? And will it be carbon neutral or better? The problem is, if you look at the first generation of biofuels, in most cases, they can't answer all those questions positively. There's also a problem that this first generation of biofuels is not really that productive. If you look up there, ethanol, maize produces about 3,500 litres per hectare. We need to move rapidly to cellulosic crops, like switchgrass, producing about 10,000 per hectare. Even when we come to biodiesel, Oil palm will produce about 6,000 litres per hectare. 
Pretty good. But the fourth generation of biofuel, though it's based on algae and bacteria, promise enormous amounts of biodiesel. We could begin to envisage that every little village has got a generator, as it were, or a fermenter, as it were, that's producing this biodiesel from algae. When we get to that stage, we're beginning to think about substituting a petroleum oil-based chemistry with one that derives effectively from plants. It'll be a major transformation, and I think it'll happen in your lifetime. The other problem we have is that production of grains is not going up very much. One of the reasons, you can see that here, some, you can see that here, but increases in yields going on in South Asia and China, but in Africa, the yield is one ton per hectare. I like to say that that's what we used to get in Britain under the Roman Empire. That yield is so flat you could skateboard down. And one problem is that we have dramatically cut the public investment in agricultural research. That's not been the particular problem for the developed countries. The private sector has produced the seeds, the technologies that we need in agriculture, in North America and in Europe. But for Africa, it's been disastrous. And you can see this dramatically. Each year, public sector funding for research has gone down. The consequences of all these drivers are this. This food price hike that we had may have been an inconvenience for many people in the West. Some of you may have had to spend more on food than you would otherwise do. But 100 to 150 million people are more hungry in the develop, developing countries than before the price hike. And that is on top of what we already have. 850 million people who are chronically undernourished. 200 million children who to wait for their age. 200 million children who are vitamin A deficient. And probably the worst statistic of all is the 400 million women who are anemic. If a woman is anemic, gives birth, she may die, the baby may die, both of them may die, or at least they will become severely ill. It's a huge number of people in the world who are suffering from the kind of malnutrition that I know your nutrition counselor is trying to So the question we have to ask ourselves is this. If the food prices have gone up, why is it that developing country farmers don't respond? Why don't they go out there, plant more food, and get better income? Where I live in Sussex, in the south of England, I'm surrounded by farms. Many of them grow turves, grass turves for gardens. They're plowing them all up to grow wheat, because they're making more money from wheat than they are from grass turves. They're responding to the market. The developing country farmers aren't responding to it. They can't. They can't for a variety of reasons. Lack of input. High cost of fertilizer. Inappropriate technologies. Poor land tenure. Lack of water. Poor extension. Variable and unreliable markets. Poor infrastructure. But the interesting thing about this list of barriers is that they differ from country to country. It's not the same list in every country. And what we desperately need 
is a proper analysis, country by country, state by state, of what the exact barriers exactly are, so that we know what we can do. So let's think back to the past. Let's think about the Green Revolution. Most of you, of course, are very familiar with this. It was certainly perhaps the greatest technological success story of the 20th century. These, of course, are some of the heroes, Norman Borlaug, as he was. That must have been in the 60s or so. Swaminathan, who led the Green Revolution in India. Votan Xuan in Vietnam. Wang Longpin in China. All recipients of the World Food Prize. It was, in many respects, a relatively simple but very powerful technology. Short straw, wheat, and, may, and, and rice varieties take up nitrogen in very controlled conditions and produce very high yields on the best farms and with the best farmers. And it worked. Prices came down. In real terms, prices came down. They went up in the oil crisis of the 70s. But thereafter, they came down and down and down. And it's only in the last year and a half they began to go up again. Although even so, they're still well below, in real terms, what they were in the 60s. But it meant that countries like India had enough food to feed themselves. They weren't dependent on handouts from the West. And that benefit of low prices went to poor farmers too. It was a great success story, but it had its limitations. It was good on very uniform lands, but these highly variegated lands of Africa, it didn't work so well. used a lot of pesticides and a lot of fertilizers, at least to begin with. And it passed Africa by. So what's the way forward? Well, I've argued that it's the doubly green revolution. And some of you may know I wrote a book about this 10 years ago, and I'm delighted to see there's some outside. I thought they'd pulped it. Uh, but I got a check for royalties last week, which I haven't had for three years. Suddenly, I thought you had to get it on eBay. Well, now you can actually buy it out here. I think the eBay one is more expensive, but you can get the one out here. My argument then, and it's the same argument now, I know it's 10 years old, but the, the guts of the argument are still the same, circumstances are different, is that we need to repeat that green revolution of the 20th century, but in a way that's more environmentally friendly, more sustainable, more equitable. I've done a lot to try and define what we mean by sustainability. The problem with the word sustainable, it means anything to anybody. What I've argued, and there's a much more complicated basis for this, is that if you think about productivity, stability, resilience, and equitability as being four things you want to achieve in agriculture, Sustainable agriculture is when you've got high productivity, high stability, high resilience, and high equity. And that's difficult because they get traded off with each other. That's why sustainable agriculture and doing research on it is one of the most exciting and challenging things you can do. To get there, you need appropriate technologies. It may well be that the appropriate technology is a traditional one, like the home garden of Java. These wonderful gardens, which some of you may have seen, around a house that are full of 10, 20, 30 more different types of crop or livestock, living together in a very close integrated system. It provides enormous productivity and resilience to small farmers Contrast here in Wallo province in, in Ethiopia is dramatic. 
If only these farmers had a home garden around them. The other technologies are intermediate. Maybe a combination of traditional or modern. They use uh, ecological information. There's a treadle pump, a very powerful tool. The great thing about these kinds of tools is that, that in the last 10 years, people have u- learned how to make them foolproof. You can buy these anywhere in India, in, pa- in, in Bangladesh, increasingly in Africa. Very simple tools that will get you water out of the ground, very little expense. And they won't break down. Here's an ecological approach. A terrible weed called Striger. It's purple weed on the left. It causes $400 million worth of damage in Africa alone. And they've discovered you can grow a legume called Desmodium in the maize plants, in among the maize plants, and it'll kill the weed. And then, of course, there are all the conventional technologies, ones that we know so well. Fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation systems, and conventional plant breeding. All have a lot to offer. Increasingly, though, we're going to have to be careful how we use these technologies. Fertilizer prices are so high, as I've shown. This is one way of dealing with that. You make little briquettes of urea and you put them in the soil in the middle of four rice plants. You cut down the amount of fertilizer you apply. Another great feat of conventional technology is the vaccine that was produced to eradicate rinderpest from the world been a scourge of cattle, causing billions of dollars of, of damage in Africa and in India way back for thousands of years. And this vaccine has been extraordinarily successful. We think now that rinderpest has been eradicated. We've now actually eradicated two terrible diseases, smallpox and rinderpest. Another recipient of the World Food Prize And then two more recipients of the World Food Prize who produced quality protein maize through conventional breeding. Managed to get tryptophan and uh, and lysine into the maize crop, greatly increasing the nutrient value of maize. It's a great achievement, but it took them 16 years. And that's one of the reasons why we start to look at modern technology nanotechnology, information technology, and of course, biotechnology. This is why biotechnology is so important. Is that we can begin to really tailor the characteristics that we want in the seed. We can say that we want the plants to be productive and stable and resilient equitable, and we can build that into the seed in a quite deliberate, determined fashion. We can make them more nutritious. And we can deal with the new big pest and disease outbreaks. And as you know, there's two that are threatening us now. A big new outbreak of rust, new rust, that has started in Uganda, got to Iran, and is threatening Pakistan and India. And then a new outbreak, beginning of potato blight. One form of biotechnology is tissue culture. Been very successful here in producing new rices for Africa. Crosses between the Asian and the African rice produced by Monty Jones, who also a recipient of the World Food Prize. Fantastic rice. Most Asians look at that picture and say to me, that must be in Asia. What are those kids doing there? I say, no, it's in Uganda. 
This is a new form of rice that combines the very best features of Asian and African rices and produces three tons per hectare, virtually no fertilizer. And then, of course, there is the growth in genetically modified crops, growing dramatically in developing countries, particularly in India and China. There is already considerable investment in biotechnology occurring in Africa. The lady there in the biotechnology lab, Dr. Gahakwa, is going to be here this week. The problem has been that we haven't yet been able to genetically modify crops and release them that really will benefit millions of small farmers in Africa. Genetically modified cotton is working very well in China and India, and 10 million farmers are now growing genetically modified cotton. But we need new forms of genetic modified seed that will deal with some of the most intractable, intractable problems. We need, for example, golden rice, Rice with the genes that are precursors of vitamin A. Lack of vitamin A kills about 2 million children a year. Another possibility here is something called the diamond back moth. Diamond back moth is a rather pretty moth. Its caterpillar causes sort of artistic rendering of cabbages down in the left. And experiments are showing that a GM cabbage and control that category. That's the kind of thing we need. The Chinese have got about 20, 30 different GM crops that they've got through most of the testing but haven't yet released. The Indians are working very hard on cauliflowers and brinjal and others. So I think in the next couple of years we're going to see much greater release of GM commercial crops. When we have a new technology, we always have to ask a set of questions. And these, I believe, are the key ones. Think about those technologies I've introduced. Do they work? Are they value for money? Are they equitable and sustainable? What are the downsides? And what's the counterfactual? By counterfactual, what would happen if you didn't use the technology. But technologies, of course, are never enough. Technologies have to be within some larger context. That was true of the original Green Revolution. It's even more true now. And what I've become interested in is this notion of layered intervention. The kind of thing we did in Western Kenya under the Rockefeller program, which Agra, Dr. Namanga is now running, has taken over. They are expanding this idea of layered intervention. It's sort of midway between working in a village down here and a big integrated program over there. So in Western Kenya, what we did was to help develop new hybrid mazes public sector, CIMID, working with National Agricultural Research Institute in Kenya, but then being purchased by the private seed companies, who in turn produced better hybrids for sale, selling them through small agro-dealers in every village, having fertilizers made locally, Creating cereal banks, little co-ops where people could bring their seed, their grain, rather, for sale. Private markets give you a good price and good information. That's the problem with inputs at the moment. Great big sacks of fertilizer. In the old days, that's how seed and fertilizers were distributed. That's my grandfather on the right over there. 
horse and cart went round the farms with seed and fertilizer in the back. In Africa today, we've got these agro-dealers, mostly women, selling little bags of seed and fertilizer, but with a government credit at the beginning of the season so they can buy them. Here on the left, a cereal bank in Kenya. Co-op. People bring their grain in, store it all together. And note, the man on the right has got a mobile phone to his ear. He's getting the latest price in the various markets nearby. The price is provided by a government information system. So it all begins to come together. These different interventions, some government, some private, some public-private, start to work together. And then, of course, you've got to build regional markets. And one of the great announcements of the last couple of weeks was that the World Food Programme, which will be here this week, has announced a programme called Purchase for Progress. But they're going to start purchasing their grain from local markets, local producers in Africa. But beyond that is the need for farmers in Africa to get involved in high-value markets. And there's a study by IFPRI of pigs in Vietnam and horticulture in China that shows that this kind of contract farming really does work. Small farmers really do benefit. There's always a fear, of course, that they may get themselves deep in debt. But certainly these studies suggest that it works. See here, this is on the lowest plateau of China. Uh, plastic greenhouses. It costs only, um, I think it's about $1,000 to build one of those plastic greenhouses, producing high-value flowers. It's another example of entrepreneurship. I took this photograph up on the lowest plateau of China. Growing wheat. I noticed they were growing trees in among the wheat. I said, what are you growing? They said, oh, we're growing walnuts. I said, walnuts? Why are you growing walnuts? They said there's a good market in Singapore for walnuts. It's thousands and thousands of miles from Singapore, the lowest plateau. It's that kind of entrepreneurship that small farmers need. And here in Rwanda, I was there recently. Uh, many of you, I think, will know that Rwanda coffee is a very special coffee. Bourbon coffee. You can actually now go to some coffee shops in the United States and demand coffee from a particular village in Rwanda. And the young women in the villages actually do the tasting. Do the tasting and they brew the coffee, and they spit it out and they write on the little labels, work out whether they've got a good quality coffee or not. Part of this is about quality control, how you get the value added. And I think this kind of levered, layered intervention can work at national level. And the example which shows this is Ghana. Ghana is the only country in Africa that will reach the Millennium Development Goal for poverty and hunger. In fact, it's reached it already. What is interesting is it's done it through technology, new maize varieties, new cassava varieties, new pest control for cassava, bigger crops and better markets for cocoa and pineapples, and most important, good infrastructure so that farmers can get their produce to market. I think it's another example of layering interventions in. In this case, through a very good government, in particular two quite remarkable ministers of agriculture. But, that all looks good, but we've now got to cope with climate change. Climate change is about temperature, and it's also about water. It's actually more about water than it is about. 
Some places will get hotter, some places will get colder, some places, places will have more rain, some places will have less rain. There will be rising sea level, more intense cyclone, salt water incursions. All those things will happen as a consequence of climate change. But what happens in each individual place is still very difficult to determine. This is what we think will happen in Africa. The temperatures are at the top. Basically, it's showing something of the order of five, six degrees centigrade increase in temperature in North and Southern Africa. Five, six degrees is an awful lot. The average here may be less than a year, since, uh, less than a centi centigrade, one centigrade since the Industrial Revolution. At the bottom is the rainfall. We're going to see 10 to 15 percent drops in precipitation in North and South Africa. But the problem is we don't really know what's going to happen in the middle. Well, in the Congo, it's going to get wetter. But uh, with due respect to the Congolese, they probably won't notice that. But for example, right the way across the Sahel, we've had a 30-year drought, unparalleled drought. One of the base causes of the Darfur tragedy we're seeing now. We don't know whether that's going to end or not. We don't know whether the Nile is going to run dry or not. We don't know whether the Zambezi is going to run dry. We think there may be more rain in East Africa and Ethiopia. But for the most part, we don't know what's going to happen. And that's true of a great deal of the world. There's still an enormous amount of research that's got to be done to find out exactly what's going to happen in your particular neck of the the biggest impact of climate change is going to be on agriculture. It used to be thought, well, carbon dioxide is good for crops. Carbon is the building block of life, and so the more carbon dioxide we have, the more yields we'll get. And in the laboratory and in greenhouses, you do get that. But in real life experiments, the increases may be 10 to 15 percent for wheat and soybeans. Nothing, of course, for May. And the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, said that despite those increases from carbon dioxide, Northern Africa yield losses are going to be of the order of 18% for the, the maize of 22%. The biggest problem I think we're going to face is drought. Much of Africa is going to become a great deal drier. And we need to focus on what we should do about that increasing drought. We can, of course, breed drought-tolerant crops, produce drought-tolerant cropping and farming systems, get more sustainable water supply. This is a wonderfully dramatic. This is the fault in Svalbard, way up beyond the Arctic Circle. This is the vault where the Global Diversity Trust, Biological Diversity Trust, is storing the seeds of all the plants in the world that we use in cropping. We've got 300,000 samples down there already. And I asked them what I should say, and they said, say to them that for $35 million, you can store all the genomes of maize, of corn, for eternity. So every generation will have them to you. That sounds like a bargain to me about the equivalent of two bankers' bonuses. 
I promised I wouldn't make a political statement. And we need that diversity. And we need it for this kind of reason. This is what's going to happen with climate change. We're going to see the distribution of temperature or rainfall dramatically shifting. In effect, we're going from one niche to another in the same place. You may have varieties that are adapted to the blue niche, but very soon you're going to need varieties adapted to the red niche, and you're going to need that in about 30 years, which is really only two, crop, two breeding cycles. And that's why we need that diversity. We also need cropping systems that will be tolerant of drought. This is conservation farming. You know it all here as minimum tillage. It doesn't quite look like the minimum tillage you practice here, but it's the same principle. Traditionally in Zimbabwe, what they do is plow the land and then replant the maize seeds in the furrow. But that way you lose the soil, you lose the water. And what they're now doing is simply harvesting the maize cobs, cutting the stalks and letting them lie on the ground. You can just see them on the bottom there, on the right. You dig then little holes along the rows. You put the seed and a little bit of fertilizer in each hole. And the results are dramatic. On the left is some soil which has been cultivated by plough for three years. You kick it, as I did there, and it's dry. On the right, it's been under this minimum tillage. I kicked it, you can see my shoe. And it's sticky, it's wet, just after three years. The farmer on the left got nothing that year I was there, last year. The farmer on the right got two tons per hectare. And they differed by about two meters. You can think about irrigation as an answer, but very little of Africa is irrigated, and the potential is really small. Maybe Mozambique, maybe Angola, maybe the Sudan. But by and large, that's not how one's going to be able to do it. We need much more innovative soil and water conservation measures. I was in Ningxia province uh, a couple of months ago, which is in northern um, China, up on the Mongolian border. And they took me round from one municipality to another. Whenever we got to a municipality, the mayor and everybody else came out and said, come and see our experiments. I counted 38 different kinds of experiments to preserve soil and water in that province of China. It's that kind of entrepreneurship experimentation that we need. But the problem that's we're going to face is that we're going to have floods and droughts with greater intensity and greater frequency in the same place. We had it in Britain the last three years. We had the worst drought we've ever had three years ago, and then we've had the worst summer we've ever had for rain this year. We're going to oscillate between flood and drought. To cope with that, we have to make people more resilient. And the way to make people more resilient is to have a more diverse livelihood. In the West, by and large, a family consists of two people, two adults. And they each have one job, nine to five or whatever it is. And that's where the income comes. With poor farmers, there's more diversity of livelihood. And actually, that is going to benefit here in Kenya, for example, farmers will adopt six different ways, on average, of coping with a drought out of that long list. But they will use three of those ways in a normal year. So they already rely on different ways of feeding their family and of making some money. 
Here's an example. This is the Sundarbans of India. This woman has got a rice field, but she's also growing vegetable crops. She sells. She has a husband on the left, and he and the son raise fish fry for sale. He's also got a little sort of bicycle taxi, which he rides around the village and takes people and their produce to market. So they've got the rice, they've got the, the horticultural crops, they've got the fish fry, they've got the taxi. Then as I was going out, I looked up, and on the roof, there's a solar panel. But ah, what do you use that for? He looked at me as though I was sort of stupid. He said, well, we have some lights on in the evening. Oh, so the children do their homework. Because if the children do their homework and they get the education, they can go and get a job in a nearby town, and they can send money back to the family. So that family, when the next big flood comes, the next big drought, soil erosion, whatever it is, they will have at least something they can fall back on. And that's what the future is going to be like. But then finally, we shouldn't just be thinking about what happens on the ground. We also have to think about the international architecture. We have a whole range of bodies in the world that deal with agriculture. Many of them are going to be present here this week. FAO, the CGIR, the World Bank, various donors, NGOs, the private sector. And at the moment, they're all getting worked up about the food crisis and doing what they can do. There's going to be reform of the FAO, reform of the CGIR. Gates Foundation is coming in with big money into agriculture. Private sector is cleared up. But it's still not very coordinated. And one of the proposals is that we will have a new global partnership for agriculture and food. That will probably be launched at the beginning of next year. Some way of getting better cohesion among all these people. So these are some steps that we need to take to deal not just with the current food crisis, but the chronic problem of hunger. I'm going to end with this. My little town where I live in Sussex is called Lewis. It's uh, famous for lots of things. It's the university where I was president. It's got a great tradition of radicalism, which it got from that gentleman who's on that pound note. We started printing our own notes as our response to the financial crisis. You can buy them on eBay. They're very expensive. And of course, on the pound note is one of the great former residents of Lewis, who you all recognize, right? Tom Payne. Went from Lewis to the United States and got you all stirred up. And I just want to leave you with the quote at the bottom of the pound note from Tom Bain. We have it in our power to build the world anew. And I think the hour there is much more about you than it is about people like me. It's your generation that's going to have to cope with all these crimes we deal with. But hopefully, by being smart, by being analytical, by working hard, by devoting yourself, you may be able to produce a really good new world in the future. Thank you. We can uh, take some questions, if, and I'd ask you try to, to use the microphone there in the center aisle.
think you're a bit dumbstruck by the challenge I've given you. Up. Yeah, oh, it's on. Be close to it. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask a question about genetically modified food crops. Uh, do you anticipate that there's going to be more rapid development and an adoption of genetically modified crops in Africa and some of these poor countries, or are they going to continue to be kind of strongly influenced by the European Union perspective? I think it'll be slow, and. There's an awful lot that we can do in Africa without having genetically modified crops. I think it's very important to make that point. There's a lot of technology there already, but there are problems that are going to be difficult to solve. The new rust, the potato blight, um, some of the problems, I think, with cow peas, and improving drought. So I think it's going to become necessary eventually. I don't think we'll see it happen very rapidly. I think it'll happen relatively rapidly in China. The Chinese are very nervous because the crop they really want to commercialize is genetically modified rice. And they're worried about what will be the world reaction to that. But my guess is that they'll probably commercialize that in the next couple of years. When that happens, they'll start to commercialize the other 20, 30 crops that they've got. So I think we'll see it taken up rapidly in China and also in India. I think it'll be slower in Africa, but I think it will happen eventually. But it's not, let me say this very clearly, it's not a magic bullet. Genetically modified crops aren't on their own going to solve all these problems. The whole of my lecture was about the fact that there are many things we have to do. This is just one weapon in the armory. Well, Ken Quinn is always right. And in this case, he's especially right. If you, I actually, somewhere in the book, in fact, I've actually got a graph of the roads per hectare of arable land in India and the rest of Asia and Africa. It's dramatically different. India has got a fantastic road system. Most of Asia has got very good road systems. So, the, On the one hand, you can get your inputs, seed and fertilizer to the farmer. On the other hand, you can get your crops to the market. And you can also link with the urban area. Most poor farmers get out of poverty because they've got some link with an urban area. They've got a relative who lives there. They've got a son or daughter who's gone to work there. They found a way of selling something in the urban area. It's not just so much about roads, but about connectivity. And that's why information technology is so important. In a sense, modern information technology is a partial substitute. I say partial. Partial substitute for roads. It's connecting for people urban areas and to markets is what gets them out of poverty. I've been attending every lecture that I can about sustainable agriculture for a couple of years, and there's almost no overlap between what I've been hearing and what you've been saying tonight. Uh, what I've been hearing is about the need to cut back on the, the use of carbon, to uh, do things more locally, uh, because there won't be the energy to do the amount of transportation, uh, use of, of organic methods, and uh, all sorts of things like that, which I'm sure you know about. What I'd like to hear you talk about is what you see as the role or, or what your attitude towards that sort of sustainable agriculture is and what significance you see that as having in the future. Well. I think if you, if you reflect on the, the case examples I gave you, you will see that what I was talking about was 
more integrated approaches to sustainability. In other words, not saying that the only answer is to be organic, but to use organic materials alongside uh, imported fertilizer. You, in many places, you can't do it by organic alone in Africa because there's nothing there to put in. There's no organic matter to put back. There are in some places, but not all. The same with pest control. You may be able to control a pest by a natural enemy of some kind or another, but in many cases it doesn't work as well as you would hope it to do. I was lucky in Borneo, uh, we got it to work very well, but I still had to use a pesticide against one of the pests because there wasn't a natural enemy available. So what I'm really saying is there is an approach to sustainability that is about the integration of more organic means with very smart use of modern technologies. And I think that's the way forward. That's what I'm saying. Please. Um, you mentioned extension, which I thought was, was really wonderful. I think a lot of people forget about the value of extension. So I'm wondering, are any of these organizations working on getting extension to Africa, where they most need it. And I think it's one of the unfortunate things that many of the old extension systems in Africa have broken down. There's a real problem with extension in Africa, as opposed to extension in, say, here in the United States or extension in, in the Green Revolution lands. If you've got a relatively uniform land and a relatively uniform agriculture. Your extension consists of relatively simple messages. The problem is in Africa that every farm is different from every other farm. And what you actually need is one extension worker per farmer. So maybe the answer is to turn farmers into their own analysts and their own extension workers. I could give you another whole lecture on how you can help farmers be the analysts and the problem solvers on their own or in groups of farmers. So that's part of the answer to extension. The other part is to give those women who are agro-dealers more knowledge and information. You know, it's a bit like these days, if you don't feel well, you may not actually go to a doctor. You go into the pharmacy and you go up to the counter and you whisper to the pharmacist, I've got this little problem, what should I do? And the pharmacist gives you an answer. Those agro-dealers need to be the same in agriculture. You need to go in and say, look, I've got this kind of soil. What would you recommend that I grow? What kind of seed should I buy? And I think that's also going to be part of the answer. I don't think we're going to go back to the old traditional extension systems that we had in the past. I think I've got one more. A little short, I guess. Uh, thank you for coming here tonight. Um, I recently read about China, Chinese government going to allow uh, community landholders to sell their land. And I was wondering your opinion on what you think will be, uh, how that will impact food production in China and also uh, food security. Yes, I'm not sure. I don't know that that's definitely going to happen. You may be right. Um, what farmers have got security of, of tenure for, I think it's 30 years or something at the moment. I think it will happen, not necessarily immediately. Um, the model has been Vietnam, where they have allowed farmers to sell their land, and farms have begun to get larger. You have to, you have to control this fairly carefully. If you suddenly get massive growth of farms, acquisitions, you then get an impoverished workforce on the land. If it goes relatively slowly, you'll begin to get farms that are viable. One of the troubles, for example, in Africa is the average farm size in countries like Malawi is half a hectare. You, you can't feed a family on half a hectare. You need to get it up to one or two hectares. And I think that's probably what's going to happen in China. So I think the ideal, and maybe the Chinese can do that, is to have 
as it were, a measured degree of sale of land and an increase in farm size. Thank you, Sir Gordon. And before we adjourn, uh, Don Bites is going to announce the uh, award winners. And uh, before that, I have a token of our appreciation to present uh, to Sir Gordon Conway. Uh, it's a crystal which is inscribed inside uh, using modern laser technologies of a sculpture, an image of the uh, Christian Peterson sculpture, the, the uh, uh, corn husker. Thank you very much, President Joffrey, and thank you very much, uh, Sir Gordon, for a wonderful presentation. Our evening has been enhanced by a poster competition. Undergraduates and graduate students who have been doing 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 graduate